Ben Pearson with Roaster Tracker. Today we're going to talk about the sun, you know, that big fiery yellowish globe of stuff that happens every day, unless you happen to live on one of the poles, which really cool if you're watching this. The sun has obviously been known by, I mean, since prehistoric times. I mean, people track the sun, animals track the sun, even plants track the sun. It's one of two objects that you can plainly resolve that are in the sky. Although we didn't really know a whole lot about it until the advent of the telescope. One of the big ways that we learned about it was by pointing a telescope at the sun and not looking at it. You do not want to look at the sun through a telescope. Don't do it. But if you point it at the sun while you're not looking at it, it will broadcast an image down which you can kind of see. And so people using telescopes were able to do that kind of observation. They were able to see that, hey, it's not all uniform. They were able to start seeing sunspots. And so we have records of the counts of sunspots that go back to the 15, 1600s, roughly. So that was a big revelation that the sun was not an absolutely perfect sphere because it had generally been assumed so. And it was pretty neat to be able to see that kind of thing. The observations that happened after then were kind of a combination of a lot of things. The solar corona was observed during eclipses because you block out the main part of the sun. You can still see the outer parts of the atmosphere and they could see it blowing around. They hypothesized that it had a very thin atmosphere that went out even to around Earth. And one of the big things they saw is they saw a coronal mass ejection, one of these big giant explosions that happens periodically on the sun. And a few days later, they had a uh, geomagnetic storm and they connected the two together and said, hey, maybe these are related. So there was some kind of a storm that produced some charge of particles that hit Earth, but the northern lights are visible all the time if you're looking right. So there must be some constant stream that periodically has a larger stream. And that stream is called the solar wind. There actually was some pretty decent theories, but a lot of them couldn't really be tested until you could get out into space. Uh, solar wind, you have to be far beyond space in order to capture it beyond the Earth's orbit, beyond the magnetosphere, which we didn't even really understand that well. In order to get pristine samples of it, though, you have to be pretty far away. And so some of the early missions were set to explore this area. Now, most of these were trying to go to the moon because one of the early missions of the space race was to hit something on the moon. The first attempt that actually got decently close was the Soviet Lunar 1 probe, which flew fairly close to the moon within, I think, one or two lunar radiuses of it, which is pretty good, actually, although they were probably trying to hit it. And as it flew around, they were able to continue to monitor it and they were able to get some kind of a sense of the solar field that is beyond Earth. A similar thing happened with the Ranger um, 4 that was the first US mission to do essentially the same thing. A little bit more sophisticated, but it failed even more spectacularly. Interestingly enough, the Soviet Union never had a dedicated mission to look at solar stuff. Uh, they had it as a byproduct of many of their missions to observe the sun while they were on their way, particularly heading towards Venus. But they didn't really have these dedicated missions to study it like happened from the United States. The United States sent a bunch of these solar probes to understand things. And most of the probes that were sent in the 60s, 70s, and even 80s were to better understand the solar wind and other kinds of what we call space weather today. It was known that these kinds of things had a big influence on things like radio wave propagation and in serious incidences they could even take out the electrical grid so they wanted to better understand this and it also helped to fit into the models better of the sun formation of star formation. So all of all, it was a pretty good thing to be researching. The Pioneer 5 through 9 
were launched into various parts of Earth or, well, near Earth space, looking at this environment, and they were able to get some kind of a sense of it. Many of these probes were actually still operating, and they were turned off essentially because there was a lack of funding. I think Pioneer 6 was still working until roughly the 2000s. One other big mission that happened back in, I think it was the 80s, was the Helios missions, which were kind of the predecessor to Parker Solar Probe. They were sent in very close to the sun, as close as they could, although they did a direct from Earth launch. So they didn't have the benefit that Parker Solar Probe has of flying by Venus to get closer and closer. Uh, these missions were actually produced by Germany. They were the first interplanetary spacecraft produced outside of the United States or of the Soviet Union. And they were, a, for a long time, the fastest objects that had ever been created by humans as they were orbiting closely and closely around the sun. They collected a lot more data. The solar wind near Earth, it's pretty pretty level, but it's a lot more chaotic the closer and closer you get. These spacecraft went inside of the orbit of Mercury, and so they were able to better study in that situation. Another big one that happened in the 60s and 70s was the Apollo program collected samples of the solar wind. They would leave these collection tubes. Uh, Apollo 11 was only had a single EVA, so it was only on there for a few minutes. Whereas some of the later missions had much, much more time. And so they were able to get some of excellent samples of this. And they were able to see the isotopes and better understand how the sun was made. Fun fact, this one was actually created by the Swiss. I did not know until I started researching this that any other country had anything to do with the Apollo program other than passively monitoring it. But the Swiss, of all people, sent in an experiment to collect the solar wind from the Apollo astronauts. Another set of spacecraft that's interesting is the Orbiting Solar Observatories. This was a series of eight launched and six functional, so two of them never worked, uh, spacecraft that observed the sun. You had to have so many of these because these were still in Earth orbit, so in order to have constant visualization of the sun, you had to have a lot of them. But they were able to observe it in x-rays that you can't see from Earth, and they were able to verify that, hey, all of this stuff is still working just as well, as according to the predictions. So pretty cool stuff. We're able to see on the inside of the sun. The 90s brought some big changes. One of them was the Ulysses spacecraft. Now, we are only able to observe roughly the equatorial regions of the sun because that's the region that we go on to see across the pole. You have to fly a mission across the pole and to get over the poles of the sun is very, very, very difficult. But luckily in the solar system, we have an object that you can fly by and you can go just about anywhere if you can fly by this object and that is the planet Jupiter. So the Ulysses spacecraft flew by the planet Jupiter and it, instead of like a slingshot maneuver outside of the solar system, it used it to bend its trajectory so that it would go over the poles of the sun and thus we were able to get some observations there. All of this helps to fit into the model to better understand what this most important star is for us. There were some of these probes that also had a similar thing. Um, IC3 was another one of these that first orbited Earth, then it went to the Earth-Sun L1 point. I think it was the first one to do that. That happens to be a particularly good spot to observe the Sun because you're always closer to the Sun than to Earth, but so you could actually see things a little bit before they'll happen on Earth but you always have a good sight to the sun and you're not getting any further and you're also far away from the influences of the earth. So all in all, it's a fantastic spot to set up one of these solar observing and there have been a number of them that have been set up there. The most famous of these is probably SOHO, which also happened to find a bunch of comets. Uh, there have been many other, the most recent one was called the Discover mission that was actually launched on a Falcon 9 rocket the first interplanetary mission of a sort that SpaceX had. 
it um, is still out there producing data. It's more known for its pictures of Earth, and especially when you have something cool like the moon photobombing Earth when it's going through. So cool, these images. But I digress. We continue to launch some of these L1 solar observing spacecraft, uh, SOHO, WIND, and more were launched ACE. And we haven't really launched that many since then, other than the Discover previously mentioned, which was launched eh, six years ago. But uh, we also launched a mission to collect a fresh sample of solar wind to hopefully better understand it, one that could work for a much longer time than the Apollo missions operated. And that was called Genesis. It went around collecting the solar wind and unfortunately, the spacecraft crashed when it landed on Earth because of some poor design. They still were able to keep the samples relatively pristine, but it, uh, well, definitely made it a lot harder to get any useful data out of the mission. Maybe someday we'll send a replacement for that. These days, the main focus has been on continuing to monitor space weather with things like the Discover mission, or in sending missions to get deeper and deeper inside of the atmosphere with the Parker Solar Probe. And the Europeans also have one that I should remember the name of it, but is doing a similar mission to Parker Solar Probe where they're trying to fly inside of the outer parts of the atmosphere of the sun. There is also the Voyager missions, which were not launched as solar missions, but they're providing kind of the opposite end. See, all of the area where the solar wind is called the heliosphere. And once you get really far out there, then you can start to see some interesting effects. And so the Voyager 1 and 2 spacecraft have the ability to make some kinds of observations of the solar wind environment when they're going that far out. And they're able to really learn some pretty interesting things by doing so. The bottom line is, is the sun has always been a primary focus. It's actually a separate set of missions to observe the sun than some of the other ones. They have a special division in NASA. The solar wind has the potential to do some pretty massive things to disrupt our communication, our satellites, and so on and so forth. So we need to constantly monitor it so we can ensure that all of our modern infrastructure is kept safe. And it also helps us to learn about things like global warming. We can better understand the role that the sun plays in that by constantly monitoring it. Now, there are a bunch of spacecraft that orbit Earth that also have a focus on keeping track of the sun. I'm not talking about all of those, unfortunately. Thank you guys so much for everything. Let me know whatever questions or comments you guys have. Until next time, keep on tracking. Take care, guys.